Hello, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Stacey Jo Scott. I'm an assistant professor of ceramics here at the UO. And I want to um, start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Aliki, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Celeste Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions in their communities at UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. I'm pleased to welcome Julia Half Kendall to the University of Oregon. Julia is a LA-based artist working in ceramic sculpture. Focusing on a litany of historically resonant lines and patterns, Half Kendall uses recurring symbols containing adaptable meanings to speak to a greater philosophical understanding of the familiar. Half Kendall received a BA from the University of California, Davis, before graduating from the MFA program at California State University Long Beach in 2010. She was the first Joan and David Lincoln visiting artist in ceramics at Scripps College and Claremont Graduate University from 2012 to 2015. She spent a summer residency in 2016 at the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture and has been awarded multiple grants from the Center for Cultural Innovation and most recently the California Community Foundation Fellowship in 2019. Most recently, she wrote a pivotal critique of Garth Clark's list of top 15 male artists, ceramics and fine arts, published on C-File, one of the most prominent online publications in the field of ceramics. Her response helped galvanize much needed conversations in the field of ceramics about its continuing legacies of misogyny, trans exclusion, and racist appropriation and erasure by publicly holding one of the most prominent voices and publications in the field to task Julia is helping create a more just present for ceramics. She says, it is a problem for students and young people looking to your publication for information. If they are women, POC, or genderqueer, they must sift through most mainstream publications to find artists that are relatable, reflecting their backgrounds, genders, and identities. Why not help these students, the future of the field of ceramics, by offering a wider view rather than reproduce the exclusions that are and have historically been made in the art market. Please join me in welcoming Julia Half Kendall. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Thank you, Stacey Joe and Brian and everyone who I've met so far, and thanks for coming. Um, that letter is fairly recent, so it's really powerful for me to hear it read back to me <laughs> and really um, so nice to hear your words about it too. It, um, um, and I'm happy to answer my lectures not really, I mean my, my work, my life is kind of intertwined with my work so in some ways it's related to that but if you would like to talk about that more at the end of question and answers I'd love to talk about that more. Um, so I'm just gonna go right into it and start with, um, oh, there is sound. Sorry. I didn't realize there was sound on that. There we go. Sorry, we're going back. This is funny, because the whole point was to kind of have this like slow meditative start. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, OK. I'll do it once, and once eventually. Here we go. OK. Nope. <laughs> nope. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. I got it. You got it? <laughs> I think. We'll try. Okay, yeah, okay. no, we're gonna like, okay. I don't know if it, we might have lost the moment, but <laughs> I just wanted to um, start by watching the ocean um, and the waves and think about, um, this is in Hawaii, um, where I was lucky enough to go at some point um, recent, it was in the last few years, and um, thinking about water and the ocean as a metaphor for so many things. Um, and the repetitive nature of it, um, as it breathes in and, in and out, tends to instantly calm me anyway, and I think it's a pretty calming thing to, to watch. Um, 
in general. Um, I'm really uh, excited by tide pools. Um, I don't know if that's a, that's a common enough thing that people know, but it's basically like sea life down by rocks um, near the ocean. Um, the scale of the ocean is so overwhelming and vast, I almost can't believe it. There's a lot going on within each drop so that it's different from our human existence. That, that is so different from our human existence. And it keeps crashing and crashing reliably over and over. And I like that you can count on the waves crashing. Um, I, I have a lot of frustrations, as that letter might have uh, revealed, or the, the letter that Stacey Joe was talking about. I think we all, as humans, have a lot of suffering and anger that we don't always know how to express. Um, I think that we all find different outlets for it. Um, one of the ways that I've found, besides looking at the life, the macro, the micro life within um, tide pools and the ocean, is working with ceramics. And um, I think that my mentors would actually disagree with me saying that ceramics is therapeutic. I think that there's been a lot of people who have fought that notion of ceramics because it's not taken seriously enough if people consider it to be therapeutic. Um, but I, I disagree and I think it's very therapeutic. Um, and I think that, um, I think it's a really powerful tool when it's used to um, express. Um, this is new work um, from very recently that is a uh, representation of a lot of frustrations and anger and feelings, um, but also finding humor um, through making it, through being in it. Um, I, I'm recognizing a gray area that is not really angry or silly, but both. And I'm defining a new space where these seem seemingly opposing forces can coexist. Um, this new gray area that I'm making or looking for is actually more relatable than binaries that we create as humans because it's about the complexity of existence, relationships, and emotions. So these sculptures that I'm showing you are inspired by flip books that I made um, when I was on residency in Berlin last year. And I was waiting for my, my clay to arrive um, from uh, the clay store, it, and you know, it had to be delivered, and things in, in Europe work really different than they do here, and there's a lot more waiting, as I found out. Um, and I found myself really um, kind of like antsy, and so I decided to just make a bunch of flip books. And, and thinking about these like handheld, um, almost like toys that we, I made when I was a kid, how there's like this movement implied in them, but it's a really basic drawing um, thing. And a lot of my flip books were about like punching things and smushing things, and they're really colorful, and they were really <coughs> funny. Um, and so then I started making these sculptures that had this idea of smushes and um, intersection and um, exposing and covering up. And they all had this, um, this one thing in common, which was what I'm realizing is like kind of like this shit. Like, <laughs> um, it's like, I mean, I'm calling it, I like labeling things. I use language a lot in my art, um, in my practice, because I feel like it helps with all the chaos. Um, and so I've been calling this gunk the, the nothing, the everything, or the shit. Um, and it's kind of a metaphor for the nothing, the everything, the shit is like everything that, <laughs> that we have to get through um, in our existence, but also how we need to like accept that as part of our existence as well. We can't, we fight it, but we also are a part of it. Um, I think I'm going to, I'm going to read this little thing I wrote about <coughs> shit to to help explain what I'm talking about. Um, so there, and I apologize for the profanity, I'm gonna say shit a lot. Um, there, there is a lot of shit 
Sometimes you must push through the shit in order to get to the stuff that's not shit. But the shit can be pretty. It can be good shit. It can be the shit. But it can also just be shit. You push through it, wading through, trying to get, to the, get it to stay to the sides, but it never will stay. It will seep, flow, turn into a wave that is actually kind of beautiful for a time, and it catches you off guard and you gaze at it and you get a little bit lost in this beautiful manifestation of all the shit that you've been trying to shove aside in order to get to some better thing. When maybe the shit is not that bad and it's actually in the shit where you want to live. Let's explore this shit. Let's wrestle it, stomp it down. Punch, kick, headbutt it if it feels right. It's everywhere. You've seen it. Nobody really talks about it, partly because a lot of people are part of the shit and because everybody shits. Maybe we should succumb to the shit. It can't be avoided. It is everywhere. But you have to fight it while succumbing to it. Or neither fight nor succumb. It is neither extreme, but inaction feels terrible. Uh, it is being in it, swimming through it, clawing through it, and then looking down at the gunk between your fingers and realizing that shit is pretty. Um, the negative space is the positive space, the scattered bits are the lead role, the leftovers are the main course. And then I'm going to show an animation that illustrates that, that I made from the flipbook series. And maybe that'll make more sense what I just read. And I'll talk over it. Um, I made these flip books as a sense, as an origin story for a lot of the shapes that I make. Um, they're little flip books, so it's really exciting to see it as a giant animation on a big projection. Um, and in making the animation, I realized how it really defined how I make the work, like showing this fluidity between forms and the way that I work with clay, really creating a, um, it's almost like showing the process of how I make things. And I think a lot about this, um, the pieces I just showed you had a lot of really repetitive detail work and there's a lot of meditative slow, tedious time I spend in the studio. And in making this animation, I also realized that it has a pacing to it that's very rhythmic, meditative, and calming that I think is fitting. And they're also just totally silly, um, which I think is important because um, I just think humor is very essential in dealing with the shit. So, oop, not again. Okay. So, let's see. This show in April of 2019 was about connection amidst the shit and the chaos, um, which is life, but also maybe especially right now in the world. I'm, I'm not sure if it's more now, but it feels like it to me. Um, some pieces are more representational, appearing like hands interlocking or legs kicking. But I don't like categorizing them as hands um, necessarily. They become something more if I don't define them. So forms like this are interlocking, but they're not interlocking hands. I'm fine with them being seen as hands, but I also like that they could be any sort of interlocking form, like a comb or um, any sort of like intersection, really. Um, the process of working in clay is performative for me, using all of my body and negotiating space. Sometimes the sculptures show the process, 
of my hands clawing and grasping through the clay in order to make a form. Sometimes the form itself is a representation of fingers clawing through or water spilling between fingers when I'm swimming. I've been really interested in the slab as a form within itself. Um, to make a clay slab without it completely falling apart is actually one of the hardest things to do in ceramics, which is so um, counterintuitive because it's just a flat thing. But to make it a structurally sound thing, you really have to compress it. You have to put a lot of physical labor into making it just so. Um, and I like that metaphor. So I've been making a lot of pieces that incorporate this idea of a slab, but the slab itself is a sculpture. And then folding it and seeing, kind of like letting it do what it wants to do on its own. Flat foot is really inspired by the idea of creating a sculpture with negative space of a foot stomping in mud or something like that or water and how that would become a whole sculpture. Um, or swim was inspired, as I was saying, by swimming and thinking about how to sculpt water going between your fingers, which then is really a metaphor. Also, like this becomes a symbol of process of making all these other sculptures where you're kind of digging through and paying homage to like the hand that makes the clay things. Um, when I was in Berlin, I thought the tiles were so strange in the subway stations. It's a pretty um, kind of like austere city sometimes, but the color combos in the subway stations were so funny. Um, and I think they really inspired a lot of, um, in general, what I see around me is very inspiring. So I think I have to be careful in a way of like what I have around me because that really just kind of like gets infused into whatever I'm making. Um, and sometimes it's really obvious and sometimes it happens a few months later. But that was a piece that I made there and I kind of see that color happening from the tiles. Um, I'm going to talk a little about my background in ceramics. Um, failure and risk are a really big part of me working in clay and always have been. Um, this is a piece just maybe last year that I was making that did this in the kiln. Um, and so it didn't work out. Um, what I ended up doing was sawing it into two pieces after it was fired with like a tile saw and trying to like make something out of that. I don't think it really turned into anything in the end. I think I threw it away, um, which is a thing I do a lot with my work. I, I go through a lot, I break a lot of it. I go through a lot of trial and error. Um, but I like thinking about all the options along the way when things don't go right and how it can provide a potential for something that you might not be able to plan for. And a big part of that, um, I think, was because of where I learned ceramics, which was, this is a kiln mode at, um, at UC Davis. Um, this was just taken from online, so I don't, this wasn't like my kiln mode. I, I don't know these specific people. Um, but we would do many kiln loads like this, where we had one big kiln, we all had to get large pieces in it. And so we would do these crazy stacking situations. And then you have to roll the kiln into the, or the kiln bed into the kiln. So you're like, these like students, we don't know what we're doing. We're just like driving this very precarious brick monster. Um, so needless to say, a lot of things broke. Um, we were also on the quarter system at Davis, like you guys are, I guess. And we only once fired things. So this is ceramics lingo, but usually there's like a bisque firing. Um, and you, that kind of stabilizes everything. And then you glaze it, and you fire it again. We just did once firing. I didn't know there was anything different than that. So everything just broke. Um, and I was like, OK. I got very used to that as a 
a, a normal part of working in this material. And I guess I liked that because it just kept, uh, I kept doing it. Um, this is, <laughs> this is my, this is a studio shot from maybe 2007 from, from Annabeth Rosen, who was my mentor. Um, and she's still teaching at UC Davis. And obviously she's an insane worker and um, very influential and amazing person. Um, um, I started with drawing and painting and then came to ceramics um, in college, so relatively late. I didn't do it in high school or anything. Um, and, I, and also at Davis, I think it's important to point out that we didn't have any sort of wheel throwing, in, um, wheel throwing instruction. It was only sculptural, so um, it, was, it felt like a really direct connection from drawing and painting, just making it 3D. Um, and since I got so used to things breaking, I decided to work with that. So I started to work with broken pieces of fired things. And this is now in grad school where I went to Cal State Long Beach. Um, and I started making um, these weird assemblage pieces out of broken parts and like found metal. I would like zip tie things together. I had like no sculpture training, so I just zip tied. <laughs> Um, everything and like sewed fabric over things. I was really um, inspired by, well, I, I still thought by drawing. Drawing is a regular part of my, of my practice still where it, it, provides, it provides a space for me to think out ideas without having to work out engineering, which is a big part of ceramics and sculpture in general. Um, so, um, to not have to worry about things breaking is really special so I can kind of create these fantasy spaces and then be inspired by them to try to create sculptures. Um, uh, so this series is maybe the first in grad school that I really feel like I was starting to like get somewhere. I had a really hard time in grad school because um, I was making figurative sculpture uh, in undergrad and then went to grad school freaked out, did not know what to make at all, and decided to um, just start like working with these broken things and making more domestic objects. But they turned into these very strange kind of alien forms with domestic object titles. So this um, has a lot of broken kind of ceramic pieces. It has an alarm clock from a thrift store. It has this table. and. I called it the nightstand in thinking that it would be really funny if someone had this as a, um, as a nightstand in their bedroom. Um, and in that way, kind of titling has maintained, like I really like titling as a framing device. Um, untitled, this would be something very different, I think. And with the title, it creates something funny. It brings in humor it invites you in a little bit more to something that's kind of strange. Um, similarly, the bike, because um, it's on wheels and it has a flag. And um, <laughs> so there you go. Um, so yeah, I think I just want to talk about like inspiration a little bit here. Like this is the port of Los Angeles right near Long Beach. and. Um, it's one of the most like organized chaos examples that I can think of that I've seen in a while. Um, and um, I think in general, I'm really, I'm interested in the idea of systems and of like machinery. And I don't actually want to know how those machines and systems work, but I like trying to invent different ways that they could work. So if someone actually explained how the port worked, I'd probably be pretty bored. But I, <laughs> I like thinking about all the possible ways that it could. And Long Beach is so weird. There's some islands off the port, off the, the coast, that are fake islands. Like there's these um, oil, there's so much oil. Um, what are those called? Those oil, you know, the dinosaur things. Can't remember what they're called right now. Um, they look like dinosaurs, uh, but they're digging oil. Um, and they're everywhere. They're like in people's backyards. Um, there's a long history of oil being drilled there. 
Um, but so there's these islands off the coast, um, I wish I had pictures for you, that are, there's, I mean, they're actual islands, but they have these facades of buildings. It's just like a fake, like a set of a building, um, where behind the building is just like a, one of those oil things. But they, they thought that if they put like this facade of a building, then it would look pretty from the shore. And they're named after astronauts, which is so, yeah. Look it up. Anyway, uh, so, so this is a, a look at how I was, um, the process. This is inside a kiln. Um, it's funny, I used to give talks and not talk much about process, and I realized lately that maybe I um, was doing that because I was told not to by my teachers, so I would be taken seriously as like not a ceramics person. But I think process is a very important part of the way that I work, so maybe I'll talk about it a little bit more from now on. Um, so I would work on these pieces, this kind of pieces, in my studio, I would build them, like pinching basically, um, various grid or coral-like forms. Um, I didn't know what they were. It was mostly the process that was interesting to me of trying to build up as much as I could without them breaking. Um, because they were very fragile, clay doesn't like to be really, really skinny, it wants to snap, it wants to break. Um, so it was sort of just like a, a repetitive, continuous thing where I'd work on like four or five of them at a time get them in the kiln, fire them and glaze them, and then they would break more, they would change. I would have a certain color scheme that I would put into them, and then um, I would work with them to create these assemblage pieces. Um, that often started very simply, like this piece started, I knew I wanted to hang a few things and have some magnifying glasses in it. So um, from there, I just kind of went and um, added, subtracted, used a lot of other materials besides clay, used some, like in, within this, there's wood, wire, um, fabric, plaster, this cable that it's hanging from, these magnifying glasses, of course, where it gets the title. And then this piece is unique, because, at least in terms of the other ones, because I started being interested in like kinetic sculpture. Um, I th the story is just that my studio neighbor was taking a kinetic sculpture class, and he um, he was really braggy about it. He was like showing off his Arduino, and and I was like, <laughs> this is dumb, and and. Um, and so I got a fan from a thrift store and attached strings to the fan and I made a kinetic sculpture <laughs> without an Arduino and, and it was, so it was, I think a lot of my work is, is out of like rebellion actually. Um, and then I got really into fans because they're weird and cheap and they're so like alive the way that they oscillate. Um, this one started to break so that it would make that like clicking noise, you know, as, as and it, it, it alludes to this idea of like a struggle, which is so interesting because it's, it's just a fan. Um, so at this point, um, this is, I think right after grad school, I, Cal State Long Beach is a very unconventional place in many ways, at least within the ceramics department. It's very nebulous, like there aren't, there aren't a lot of set rules and that can be really good and really bad depending on what you want. Um, it worked out in this case because I was able to keep my studio at Cal State Long Beach for another year after I graduated and so I just kind of kept working, kept like going with the energy that I had towards my thesis. Um, and using like the on-campus gallery spaces during like winter break and using that as an, uh, a time to photograph, have deadlines for myself, it really kind of helped me keep momentum up. Um, and I started to think about like adding some figurative elements back in at least through like body language and stance and through titling. 
um, personality to these things. So this is Mabel. Here's a detail of Mabel. I'm just going to check I'm not missing any important notes. Um, at this point also, in terms of process, I was using this stuff called Magic Sculpt, which is a two-part epoxy putty that kind of mimics clay in many ways. And I found out that it can also be a strong adhesive. Um, so I was sticking things together, like ceramics and metal, ceramics and wood, and then it would be able to, it could like create a sort of like connection that wasn't obvious. So I could confuse where one thing ended and another thing began. Um, don't think I have any. I'll tell you when I see the magic scope next in these images. So still working through ideas um, from like creating landscapes and thinking about like this show was called Terrains because I was thinking about the landscape of all of the pieces and like what the ground looks like from above when you're in an airplane and how certain patterns emerge and um, I was looking at a lot of old maps and how representations of things on maps are so arbitrary depending on what the culture was, where it was coming from, the symbology, like the, the legends, the keys, all of that. Um, so this piece, I think, has a good story in terms of process. The bottom part was a big porcelain grid that I blew up by accident in the kiln. Um, but I then glazed the remaining pieces, kind of made something strong enough out of it. And then these, this like cube diamond thing is PVC pipes with silk sewed over the top of it. And then there's like a ceramic, um, I don't know, blob roped to it, um, sort of like an homage to those like old paintings where you'd see like a, a deer carcass like roped to a hunting expedition. And then I don't know what those porcelain like kind of, someone said they looked like a swordfish or um, there's some sort of swordfish that has like a, or a shark that has a, um, but obviously it's, it's a 3D drawing. Like, you know, it's like creating composition um, using different tools, different, different materials as my tools. Um, but kind of towards the end of this body of work, I, I really missed like working on big clay things. Um, as I said, it's therapeutic for me. And um, something about working, I was doing a lot of this, and I wanted to do a lot of <laughs> more full-bodied stuff. Um, so my work began to go more and more towards more Kind of like large ceramic only forms at this point. These were some influences in about, well, I guess these have always been influences in some way or another. Um, but I think I like to show them because they're kind of um, unexpected, at least showing like um, Betty Woodman with like, um, like the Judd forms and how those seem sort of um, in argument with each other, but I find my work to try to, I think in my work I'm really trying to bridge those sort of far reaching like binary ideas of like sometimes minimalism, but sometimes like pattern decoration and, and bringing them together and why not, why can't they be both? Um, you have June Kaneko up there um, and then you have a Matisse drawing down there. Um, okay, so this piece I think also, let's see, how do I talk about this piece? Um, I'm really interested in mythology and deities and rituals and rites, and I want to make my own version of these for my own world, um, for my specific experience of these big questions, you know, and it's, 
it's hard. I can get kind of like saccharine and all this and like sort of, I'm like perpetually that teenager that's like, why do we exist? And, you know, <laughs> like, um, I, I don't know. I, I'm stuck on that existential angst of the 90s, I guess. Um, but I try to think about it in a, a funny way, which helps me. Um, and um, so this piece, uh, is called Receptacle for Burning Negative Thoughts, and it is just that. Um, I invited, I, I burned my own negative thoughts in this, and I also invited other people to. And in that way, it became a functional object, which maybe I should talk about a little bit too. The, the idea of function within sculpture and ceramics especially is, is a really um, curious and complicated conversation, maybe. Um, I think function can be many more things than a vase or a cup or um, a flower pot. Um, when I teach, a lot of times people want to make something and then they say like, oh, but then I can put a flower in it. I could put a, like a candle in it. And, and it's like, and then it can be functional. And that's true. Sometimes that is really cool, but also what is function, you know? And like <laughs> function can be in something that's not utilitarian in a traditional way. Um, and I think this speaks to that too. Um, this idea of handles on something gives it the idea of function, but maybe um, without any sense to it because it's a blob. Um, this, kind of just going chronologically, so this piece or this installation um, is um, at my studio in Los Angeles and um, I was on that kick of trying to make really large things after making a lot of really spindly small things. and. Um, I had just moved into this new studio space and the landlord kept talking about how great the new roof was. So I thought that it would be a really good um, place to have a show. And um, so I, I made these large sculptures and I went to Ikea and I um, got all these tabletops and made these like correctional pedestals for the slant of the roof. And, um, and I had a show up there. I had to rent like a, a scissor lift to, <laughs> to get everything up. Um, so it was pretty absurd, like having these giant sculptures on the roof. But I think a lot of it was me trying to show the work in a less conventional space, not a white cube of a gallery. Um, creating these conversations like totally unintentional or maybe not conscious of like radio towers in front of this blob with arms is what I called it and how that just kind of happens the whole industry the whole world around the studio becomes part of the piece because of the framing device of the sculpture um, and also Southern California landscape as I talked about with Long Beach is extremely strange. There's, there's so many combinations of, of like wilderness or nature and industry and really kind of sometimes they're coexisting, sometimes they're battling. Um, there's like beautiful bird life, like beautiful hawks right next to, you know, the freeway um, in the middle of the city in downtown. Um, there's snakes and coyotes and raccoons, but there's also just like so much trash. Um, so I think a lot of that is in my work that I bring to the outdoors. Um, I did another piece inspired by, this is an older piece from 2012 where I made a lot of chains out of porcelain and put them um, on this other form to make a sculpture and I think about chains a lot again as this like, it's part of this idea of binaries and like how it can mean something really terrible but it can also mean something very wonderful depending on the context and it can also be something very functional or it could be something very decorative depending on the context and the use. So I made this giant chain 
out of foam and aqua resin and denim, um, and I suspended it. This was part of a, um, a piece that was commissioned at this place called the Bowtie Project, right on the Los Angeles River, which is kind of like this old run, like wasteland where that used to be um, a railroad station or a railroad stop or something or a depot. And now there's just like a lot of like these are like um, palm trees with their heads chopped off. Um, and they were just like that. And I decided it would be really interesting to kind of create this suspended chain over the top of them. Um, and there's other, this area gets curated by this nonprofit group called Clock Shop in Los Angeles. And it, they do really interesting programming. Um, it was, uh, it was an ordeal because I, I made it all in my studio. Um, and it was kind of like this paper mache type use of aqua resin, which is a, a safer use of resin, safer kind of resin. It's not toxic or not as toxic. It was basically like paper macheing all these like strips of denim over these foam forms. Um, yeah. I did one time. Um, so we're back up to 2017 now and um, kind of continuing this idea of mythology and creating invented spaces. I made a show um, called The Infinite. Um, and um, this show, so this show envisioned an alternate dimension in which a series of shapes express an ideology about gender, the body, social constructs, and coexistence of multiple points of view. So in addition to the 24 infinities on the wall, or infinity-ish forms, there's five what I call weight pieces, W-E-I-G-H-T. Um, and then I created a glossary of terms and symbols that was a free zine for people that would attend the exhibition. So it's like an actual handout thing. That was a glossary. Um, and each infinity had a carved surface. Um, so I was like digging into the clay, carving it before it was fired. Um, and each motif had an entry in the glossary. So it's sort of like you didn't need to know what the glossary said about things for you to appreciate it. But then if you wanted to research, it was kind of like a legend or a key where you could go into it and see um, what, like for instance, the the woven motif or the chain motif meant. It was inspired by this infinity that I made back in 2014. Um, that was really an investigation of like building, like the process, trying to make something out of clay that looks like it's folding in on itself, that it's looping. Because in clay, it's like it's all hollow. Otherwise, it wouldn't really work. Um, but you kind of try to hide that look that it's hollow. It's like you, you're pinching around and you're trying to make it look like it has this like movement that it's folding in, but it's actually built very much like a 3D printer works from the bottom up. And it's an interesting paradox, I think. So the glossary is a newsprint booklet. Some of them were my drawings, some were found drawings. Um, and so I was Basing everything, sorry for the bad image, I was basing everything on the idea that there was like the dash and the torus, the sort of phallus form and the opening, the donut vaginal form, and how those were like the two binaries. And then everything else kind of was like rooted from that. I, I decided that all the shapes I was making were like rooted from some variation of that. So it talked about like the mutability of forms, of one thing becoming another, of sort of finding spaces in between the binaries. And I decided that like a, an infinity form was like both a masculine and feminine form because it had this thrusting kind of like phallic motion, but then it had openings. And so much of the uh, pieces or the motifs that were carved on top of it, like the chains or the knots, um, were in reference to that to have definitions that like um, support that kind of overarching thesis. Um, this is just another inspiration image. Um, this is at the Art Institute in Chicago. If anyone wants to go see it, it's this big, but it's like the best thing I've ever seen, I think. Just this um, 
ancient depiction of, of, of mice. Um, but thinking about how like ceramics has this history of documenting things in daily life. Um, so water is like the symbolism for me is like an entryway into this other space of the infinite. Um, eyes are like these portals. So I kind of gave these, um, each of these motifs definitions that are both like rooted in my own history, my experience, but also how society has incorporated them. So like the legs um, are kind of cartoon legs. They're also inspired by these old like diagrams of like gymnastics tricks that I saw when I was a kid that like displayed the correct way of seeing things or of doing the tricks. <coughs> Excuse me. There's combs. Um, the comb has been a recurring form for a while and it's actually what inspired making hands interlocking. It's interested in like how the letter E, if you add an extra little finger to it, becomes a comb. Um, and how the comb is a very charged politically um, object, but it's also so everyday and mundane. Um, and it's also decorative, it's also functional. So this is an early iteration of a comb, another iteration of the comb, more combs, more combs. So this is the interlocking combs that then inspired interlocking hands, combs with hair. So thinking about the positive and negative space as becoming one sculpture and how would you sculpt hair going through a comb? Well, this is how I would, I guess, do that. Um, and the weaving inspired by floor tiles, arches, Scales, knots. Sorry, I'm trying to get through so we have some time for questions. This is loops. And weights. So the weights um, were these other aspects of the show that was um, the actual remains of carving all of these pieces, then recycled into um, like water and made into these solid things. So they were the donut holes for the donut forms or the infinity forms, um, the actual negative space to the positive space. And then another quick inspiration shot of um, hair and sculpted hair and pop art and how to sculpt something that's perpetually in motion, kind of like the wave that I showed at the beginning. So then I was adding to the glossary and making more legs. More waves and hair. So these are different iterations of me trying to sculpt a wave or hair. And these are just little maquettes from the studio. Oops, showing that again. So I, I know we're low on time. I just wanted to talk about a couple of things that I have going on outside of the studio. Um, beside of, besides making work. Um, so I started this experimental school um, called the Clay LA where I decided, because I was kind of fed up of um, about like a lot of institutional teaching um, at like adjunct teaching at various institutions around Southern California. Um, I decided to start offering classes out of my studio with these philosophies in mind. Um, and it's been really exciting because um, 
it's offered the space that I think is um, different from what the traditional model of education can give. Um, and I think that in a way, like all of this work is about me trying to find like optimism amidst all of the, all the shit. Um, a lot of the work that I showed at the beginning is like this contrast of the mush and um, this sort of like formed or organized thing. And I think like um, this is what I'm doing for now to try to, along with like writing letters, <laughs> to try to kind of organize some sort of um, hope in this existence of art and ceramics and humanity. <laughs> Um, and I think I'm going to finish. I'm just going to end. I'm going to end there. So I would love to answer questions. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> it ran a little longer than I thought. A question back there. having your flipbook video presented along with the work that you did with it would add to it and kind of give it more character? Or do you think it would take away from the actual sculptural forms? I think it would add to it. Yeah, I would hope to show it alongside at some point, yeah. disconnected in the middle or are they connected or is it like two separate arches that are connected at the bottom? They're connected in the middle. Thank you. <laughs> 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 really simple questions to answer. Thanks so much for coming, Julia. I, I just right. love your work so and it's so nice to see so much of it at once, and um, it was really wonderful to see you start with the tide pool, and um, I think of your work as kind of primordial in some way, and I think the way that you kind of talked about the water and the tide pool it made me think of like a, a, a scale that's unknowable, mm -hmm. and I think seeing the work on this massive um, screen um, having seen some of it in person, um, having it be made out of the material that could be table scale and building scale, uh, it made me think a lot about um, scales related to time and ideas and physicality. And I wonder if you could just talk about ways that you think about scale, maybe physically or conceptually or just a lot yeah. of I think I, I work through scale pretty intuitively where I, I, I go back and forth from working large to working small. And I think what that's doing is sort of like I'm finding value in how my body reacts to things. Like I'm, I like the experience of um, feeling how different it is to be next to something that's my size versus something that's this size and how we have to adjust ourselves and kind of recalibrate depending on what we're looking at and what's in front of us. I, I, I just noticed that every time I do a series of large works, it's followed by a series of small works. Whenever I do a series of small works, I then do large ones. So it seems to just be like a cycle of, um, I used to think it was rebelling against one thing, but I think it's just kind of like, more of a pendulum of, of investigating the specific form that I'm making and what would it be, how would it change if I made it giant versus tiny? Because it's so different. And especially with ceramics, because weight, engineering, how you build something is so important at a large scale. But at small scale, it really doesn't matter how you build it. Like it could be solid. It could be really kind of like roughly thrown together and it'd be fine, but if you do that at a huge scale, it's going to crack and break. And so I think about it a lot. Good question. Oh, 
thanks so much for that. Um, I, um, I'm thinking about um, your meditation on shit, and I'm thinking about your letter to Garth Clark, um, and how, uh, how you exist in this um, the position of having to contend with um, a prominent voice in the field that sort of is projecting um, this position out there that affects you, affects other folks, and sort of requires in some way a response, whether that, that's sort of a fair position to be put into or not. Um, and you're actively sort of making, um, taking, taking a public stand in that. Um, and I'm thinking about this uh, through uh, the words that you used as part of your meditation. It was, uh, fight it while succumbing to it, or neither fighting nor succumbing to it. And that to me, like, maybe, um, uh, posits perhaps like a way of, of, of sort of re uh, retaining one's own sort of agency within that of choice and um, I guess I'm just curious about if you could reflect on um, maybe your position in relationship to this power in the field um, and how you contend with it um, in relationship to how you're sort of dealing with this idea of shit. Um. Well, so what's interesting is that um, I think the line after, I'm going to make sure, the line after the neither succumbing or is that neither fight nor succumb, but inaction feels terrible. So it's like kind of continuously, I'm continuously like <laughs> questioning. And maybe that's where I like find direction. Um, or like inaction, where I'm deciding to not fight or succumb to it, that might be like maybe a Zen approach. But then I'm also a very impatient person. And I feel like um, being too, for me, being too Zen, which I don't think will ever happen based on my personality, um, feels like inaction and feels like like how can I um, at times like wait and kind of let things settle, but how can I also move forward and question? And, and I ha I, I've found that I don't always know the right way to do that. I think this is, this is really the first time within the kind of like ceramics world or in my professional world that I've spoken up publicly and um, I think it was just like the right timing really of like this article being published that was just ridiculous. Me, re me realizing also that I didn't, I don't ex want or like I don't expect or want anything from that person who I was writing the letter back like he, um, like I had nothing to lose, so I actually had like a position of power that I like. I felt like I had the privilege to be able to speak up and use that privilege and power in a productive way. Um, so just, I mean, in the answer, I'm circling and questioning. I don't, I don't know if this is helping, <laughs> but writing, I guess, is is a good way for me to try to work out all these thoughts. And so that's how what led to that. I, I mean, I think that sort of like contending with the complexities of it is, um, and from your own sort of like real actual um, sense and experience of it, um, to me is like, uh, it's, it's both like based in the complexities of reality, but also like, um, yeah, like rooted in your own experience, you mm -hmm. know? So it's like, it feels real, but also it feels like seated within power, even though uh, po your power and power in general is sort of like complex and mm -hmm. contingent and messy, mm -hmm. you know, it mm -hmm. still is like um, a choice. Mm -hmm. So it may be sort of like circling and cycling like your infinity loops, mm -hmm. but um, it's still, uh, it's real. You know? Yeah, it's, you know? it is, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's maybe a more um, intuitive approach or more kind of like, um, yeah, it's it's maybe like a less traditional approach. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's part of it. I don't know. Um, thank 
Kimia. Ja. Ja. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about why you chose to open your talk with the images that you did <laughs> and how yeah. you build the natural world um, into your art. Um, I want to go back to this so we can look at those. Um, I think I, I mean, I, I, I wanted to start with the ocean peacefully doing its waves to calm myself, but it didn't work. <laughs> So, um, I think it's like a, an inspiration that isn't a directly obvious inspiration. And um, specifically, this is like Northern California coastline that's really, um, it's somewhere I, I went a lot as a kid. Um, and I think I find a lot of inspiration in um, patterns that are formed by nature, um, but like kind of like the symmetry and um, an unexpected pattern that is found without any sort of human action on it directly. Um, and that's what I find in a lot of ocean and sea life. Um, Pattern is something that is really, in, like, it's in my work a lot. Um, I don't know if I have, like, a, a clear answer <laughs> for you besides that it's something that I find beautiful and um, kind of a little scary, maybe, you know, this idea of, like, the sublime, like, how it's, like, so vast and um, sort of, like, un uncontrollable that um, and maybe because I try to control a lot of things I'm really uh, drawn to things that are completely escaped I, that I can know I can in no way try to control it um, yeah I don't know that's that's one answer I think one more thing is I just I really like seeing how artists what artists look at besides art. Because I, I think um, those things are usually a lot more inspirational than just like looking at art or going to a museum or something. And a lot more accessible. Is a question? Uh, you made a sculpture, uh, the big chain ones that you yeah. hooked up to the, looks like the dead palm trees. Hello, uh, palm trees. This is a yeah. couple of two quick questions. Where did you get all the denim to to do all of that? Because <laughs> uh, that's a lot. It's a lot of denim. Um, my my friend luckily had a some rolls of denim that was donated from someone else's project from the garment district, the fabric district in Los Angeles. So I. I happened upon a lot of free denim. How did you get it up on the palm trees? <laughs> that was the precarious part. Um, I was working with the, the state parks people in Los Angeles, and there was this old veteran guy who was like about to retire, and he was so stubborn. His name was Carl. And he, I kept saying, like, we should get a lift, but he was like, no, we don't need one. And we backed up flatbed trucks with ladders on them. Leaned against and um, did some like pulley system business. Um, they were suspended. They were up there. They were pretty stable because they were um, like we drilled through and put cables and suspended. Like there was there was some armature or like hardware holding them up so they wouldn't just like fall. But to get them up, it was really um, yeah. It, 
when we, when we took it down, we didn't do it that way. <laughs> um, but everyone was okay, luckily. No one got hurt. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Thank you so much. Thank you.